Hi, today we're going to be talking about the James Webb Telescope, long awaited. Started out, I think, around a billion dollars. Now it's up to 10 billion and many, many years behind schedule. Um, but it's going to be a game changer. Uh, in short, this telescope is going to be able to look back in time, um, unlike any other telescope. There was one called the Herschel by the European Space Agency, but it, it wasn't really in the same wavelength that the Webb is. The Webb is going to be able to peer back into time for real. I'm going to try to explain how that works. A lot of science goes behind it, and uh, we're not an expert by any means, but we're going to try to give you some insight into the basics and how it works where it's going to be parked in orbit, why it's there, uh, the benefits of it being where it's going to be uh, a million miles from Earth, uh, 1.5 kilometers from Earth. And we're going to try to explain, and it's, it's a lot to wrap the head around, there's a lot of science behind it, as to how it looks back in time. Does it really look back in time? You bet it really looks back in time. You'd say, well, that's impossible, that's stuff in movies. But it really isn't. If you understand the science behind it, Doppler shift, Einstein's theories. I don't even know if they're theories anymore because I think they've been proven, but <laughs> Einstein's laws. Um, you could begin to understand this, even with very little knowledge or background. You might be able to begin to understand how this works. So really, some neat stuff. Let's just look at a few photos. You can see the immense size of this thing. Um, you s notice there's five layers of insulation. That's very key. This satellite has a hot side. Not really hot, hot, but even a million miles out from us and away from the sun. Uh, and it's cold out there, but this thing has a hot side and a cold side. Uh, the hot side will basically be um, facing the sun, and it is solar powered. Surprised me, too. I thought they would have went nuclear on this, like a lot of satellites are. Um, but they have to have a real good reason for it to be nuclear, and they have to convince the NRC... And um, it just, it's not necessary at the L2 point to be nuclear. So this is solar powered, but this particular satellite must be, su half of it, one side of it has to be super, super cold. Can't have any heat, even though it's so far out, can't even have that little bit of heat from the sun um, near the sensors. So that's what these layers of insulation are for, uh, keeping the cold side from the hot side. Uh, let's take another shot here. There is This is another cool shot, which will show you what those uh, layers look like. And that's about the size of a full-size tennis court. Let's go back here and look at the business end of this, which is the actual pickup sensor, the near-infrared sensor. Sorry about the scrolling here, but we'll find it. Uh, yeah, there's tons of pictures. This is on uh, a link on their website. Okay, there's our original photo. And there's tons of them. Okay, so yeah, right here, this is the business end. This is the actual near-infrared sensor. That's what that looks like. Uh, so, so a couple of photos. All right, let's look at some some specs here. This is going to, so far, be launched in 2021 on top of an Ariane 5. That's the European Space Agency's heavy lifter out of French Guiana. Very, uh, very good track record it's had. The mission duration is going to be 5 to 10 years from this. Most of the time that's uh, determined upon station keeping, the amount of fuel you have. Um, and depending on the mission, you need to use fuel to keep this thing in the right spot. Um, but it's going to be at the L2 Lagrange point, Lagrange point 2, uh, L2, which uh, is going to save a lot of fuel and be close enough so we can communicate with it, yet far enough away from the sun um, and have the benefit of it parking in one spot and almost staying there. L2, there's there's some other Lagrange points that are better, but in worse in some other ways. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so the, the mission duration is dictated usually by the amount of fuel, station keeping fuel, so that uh, you can keep it where you want to keep it. Sometimes they can do little tricks um, in order to save fuel, and quite often you'll see a lot of missions go well beyond the design life, sometimes 50%, 100% over. I don't know if that'll be the case here, but let's hope the thing just works, <laughs> because this thing has to fit into the rocket, and that's the hard thing. You have to make this thing work, but fold up into a teeny little package that fits into the fairing, and then, more importantly, unfold. Uh, so, and if that something goes wrong with that, there's no fixing it. It's going to be a million miles away, and the whole thing will be a waste. So, yeah. Definitely a nail biter. Uh, primary mare, 21.3 feet, 6.5 meters, beryllium coated with gold. Uh, there's about 
0.1 ounces of gold per panel. There's 18 uh, segments. Again, it's made this way so it can be folded into a small small piece. We'll look at that and see how it's folded. Um, some layers, the, the insulation layers, talks about the temperature that it gives you. Orbit 1.5 uh, million kilometers from Earth, as we mentioned uh, at the L2 point. Gold coating. Okay, so a little bit of spec. Uh, here's the vehicle, the Ariane 5, heavy lifter. Got a pretty good track record. I think they've only had one failure over many, many years. Um, let's see here. I don't know the launch configuration. Let's see. They probably talk about it here. Yeah, launch, single launch configuration. Um, it's the fairing size. This is a great website. It's just got everything related to the mission on it. And this is uh, jwst.nasa.gov. Pages and pages and pages of um, breakdown. And then there's a really good flash of the satellite itself and um, the subsystems and the electrical buses and so forth. Uh, okay, so this gives you an idea of how it has to fit into the fairing. So you've got this massive uh, James Webb telescope, and the thing has to fold up into a teeny little nothing and fit into the fairing. That makes it even harder. So you can see how the mirrors fold up. The big delay so far has been the insulation panels. There's five layers they have to unfurl and um, and it has to work. And they had problems with it not working. But looks like they've got it all worked out now. Because if something goes wrong catastrophically, this thing's going to be a no-go. And no fixing it, no return. Um, you know, there's, there's other possibilities like, you know, maybe four of the five layers undo and it's well enough insulated and it'll still work. There's probably some redundancy built in there. Let's hope for the best. Um, that gives you an idea how it has to fit into this Ariane 5. All right, let's take a look at the orbit, where this thing's going to be parked and why it's important, the L2 point. This was figured out uh, by a astronomer, um, Lagrange. I think he was French. Uh, yeah, Joseph Louis Lagrange, 18th century mathematician, uh, found a solution to what is called a three-body problem. That is, there are, are uh, that is, there are stable configurations in which three bodies could orbit each other yet stay in the same position relative to each other. And the whole purpose of this is to uh, put something into space that's going to stay there, um, much like a geostationary orbit on Earth, where you're balancing out the gravitational pull of the Earth, given the centrifugal force of the orbit, and it just stays in one spot. Um, that's a geo orbit. The, set, the James Webb's not going to be in that. It's going to be over here in L2. Uh, now, L2 has a little bit of a halo orbit to it there, but it generally stays in this one spot. Um, you can see there's other points. There's the L3, L4, and L5. Those stay rocks out. They don't orbit like this. It has that little halo. Um, the problem with these is they collect a lot of debris. And I don't mean space debris. I don't mean like man-made debris. I mean like rocks and asteroids, meteorites, whatever. It all collects there because there's, you know, just that's the balance point. So it's sort of like a vacuum. Not a great place to put the uh, James Webb. And putting it at the L2, we use the Earth um, and the Moon to block some of that infrared energy, I guess, um, that we don't want. We don't want it. We have a, a cold side to this James Webb, and we want to maintain that. And that's what the five layers of insulation are for. But yet we want it close enough to the Earth so we can communicate with it and get the data, not have to wait super long time for it. So it's, it's kind of a happy medium. It puts it in, into a place that it pretty much stays where you want it, relatively close to the Earth, relatively far enough away from the sun, uh, because we can't have a lot of infrared energy hitting this thing. Even the little bit of infrared energy from the sun that's hitting it now is going to be negated by the five layers of insulation. Um, this thing's got to be cryo, cryo cooled. There's onboard cryo tanks that have to cool this thing to near absolute zero in order for the infrared sensors to work accurately. Um, so that kind of gives you a basic idea of, of, of how that, uh, where, the, where this thing's going to be located. Again, that's a million miles away. It's going to take about a month to get there um, from Earth. Uh, which is 1.5 kilometers, one, excuse me, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. L2, Lagrange point two. That's what that's called. Um, yeah, okay. Let's look now. Uh, a little bit hard to explain, a little bit hard to wrap the head around. How does this thing look back in time? Does it really look back in time? It really looks back in time. Here's a comparison of a visible picture of a galaxy. Let's see. Carina Nebula, Nebula, 
invisible light on the left, and uh, infrared on the right. So you can see um, all the smoke in clouds of debris and dust. Well, you don't want that. Um, you can't see through it. One of the benefits of infrared is that you can see through smoke, clouds, and dust, just like we use infrared satellites to uh, look through the clouds on Earth. Um, here we're using the infrared to look through all that. Good benefit. Um, but more importantly, uh, it has to be near infrared to be able to look back in time. We'll try to explain that best we can. So definitely, a lot of times you'll find in science or trying to find a solution to something, it kind of kills two birds with one stone. It's just a miracle that, uh, you know, we need to be in near infrared. But at the same time, near infrared also has another byproduct or benefit, uh, being able to see through clouds and smoke. Uh, uh, you know, so a lot of times that things line up and it, and it really helps. So wavelength of light with Doppler shift. Uh, we talked about it. We did a video on a, on a water sensor and you can use Doppler with a variety of wavelengths. I mean, if you're standing on a street corner and you hear a siren on a fire truck go past you. And if you notice, if the siren is at, say, one particular pitch and it's coming at you, as it passes you, the pitch will drop. The pitch of the siren will drop. That's Doppler shift right there. You've experienced it. You may not have realized it, but you've experienced it. And Doppler can be applied to any wavelength, whether it be sound, x-rays, gamma rays, near-infrared in this case, microwaves when a cop, uh, say, gets an accurate speed on your vehicle, or they can use LiDAR, they can use um, you know, laser. Doppler shift applies to that. So... Um, if you understand Doppler, and it's pretty simple Doppler how that works, because there's just a phase shift. You have the original wavelength, and then in the case of radar, for example, you have a return wave, much weaker. But if the object's moving away from you, it's going to spread those waves out. They're going to be slightly lower in frequency on that return. And then when the math is done and you compare the original um, main bang, they call it, the main bang, or the main wave, to the return wave, the difference in those frequencies, you can calculate the speed. Um, so that's how Doppler works in a very basic sense. Um, let's find the page that explains the shifted light. And I'm just going to read it because it's, um, it's a little hard to understand, to be honest with you. Einstein's theory or, let's see, let's find the spot we need to look for here. Okay, so the early universe, it talks about um, shifted light. That's what we want. So it says here, imagine light leaving the first stars and galaxy nearly 13.6 billion years ago and traveling through space and time to reach our telescopes. We're essentially seeing these objects as they were when the light first left them, okay? You're that far away, and it took that much time for the light to reach you. And that's what light years is. Uh, it's, it's the amount of distance over a year that the light had to travel. That's a light year. Um, so if you're that far away and something occurred very far away from you, it may take billions of years before that light gets to you. Okay? And, and you can understand that. But what we need to do with the James Webb is we need to look so far out into space, but we need to look in the near-infrared to see, for example, the Big Bang, which occurred 4.54 billion years ago, and they know that through carbon dating, and you can read about carbon dating, pretty accurate, uh, estimation of the Big Bang. So if we can look far enough out in distance and see the light that occurred 5.54 billion years ago, that's still moving through space, if we could see that light, but it shifted into the near-infrared, and we'll read about why, why that occurs and why we have to look in the near-infrared, then we can actually see the Big Bang as it occurred. And that's how you look back in time. Kind of mind-blowing, I think. Uh, so, yeah, so it goes on here. By the time the light reaches us, its color or wavelength has been shifted towards red, something called the redshift. Why? In, particular, in this particular case, it's because when we talk about very distant objects, Einstein's general relativity, re relativity excuse me, comes into play. It tells us that the expansion of the universe means it is the space between objects that actually stretches, causing objects or galaxies, in this case, to move away from each other. Um, you know, kind of think of a, a firework exploding, going in all directions. Furthermore, any light in space will also stretch, shifting that light's wavelength to longer wavelengths. This can make 
distant objects, very, very dim, because now you're coming out of the visible, right? You're going into near infrared. We can't see that with our, with our eye. Um, and it says that visible wavelengths of light, yeah, it shifts, because the light reaches us uh, as infrared light. So this little diagram here shows basically what happens with, with Doppler um, and why light does that. So visible light, as it's moving uh, away from us, the waves, and you know, the faster it moves, this occurs even more, the waves get spread out, the frequency drops. As light or an object is uh, approaching you, the waves get compressed and the frequency goes up. Very slight amount, but that's how Doppler works. So, and it also says here that the web will be able to see back to about 100 million to 250 million years after, after the Big Bang. Uh, but why do we need to see in the infrared light to understand the uh, early universe? Because the light from these objects is shifted into the red. Okay, just the way it is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with learning things, sometimes you you might not really fully understand it, but you can read it. And you just have to accept it. You know, that's that's the rote part of learning something, and then the next might be understanding it, fully understanding it, and the next step in learning is is applying it, and the last step in learning is my favorite correlation. You know something about one thing, and you can correlate it to another, and go, aha, uh -huh, I see how that works. I know how Doppler works, so oh, I see how they're looking back in time. So this kind of gives you. I, I hope it gives you some real basic, like, aha, uh -huh, and you might understand how this is able to look back in, into time. Uh, real neat stuff. I think this is going to be a game changer. Um, by the way, you can, when you go to the jwst.nas.gov, there's a flash section. Um, the whole key to this website is up in the upper right, the three little lines like you have with Google Chrome up here in the upper right, the three, and the, the drop down gives you just tons and tons of places and submenus upon submenus and you can go um and there's a, a spot where you can download the uh the spacecraft itself and all the subsystems for it and i forget which menu it's in here there's just probably hundreds but if you look around you can find it and, it, and that brings up this uh this flash here interactive flash and you can go through and look at um you know all the subsystems uh, whether it be uh solar panels the antenna subsystem the uh, spacecraft bus system um a sun shield system and it breaks it down 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 so this could be a game changer um and we need to make this thing work so it's got to fit into the spacecraft it needs to unfold properly in the 30 days out to the lagrange point it needs to get out to the l2 point which is critical because that's the place it needs to be for many benefits that we we discussed and then it has to work and i think it's really going to be something I think the data that comes back is, is really going to be interesting. So I hope you got something out of the video. Uh, it's a lot to bite off and chew, but um, you can always go to this excellent website and look into the subsystems and see. But at least you know now what this thing's going to do and maybe a little bit about how it's going to do it and have a basic understanding of how the James Webb is going to look back into time for real and be able to see galaxies um, as they were born. And we can look back in the Big Bang. Can't really explain how that's going to look. But, uh, hey, we'll have to wait for the data and see. Well, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. And if you like the channel, we appreciate any comments, thumbs up, and subscribe. Hit the bell. Thank you very much.